All right, welcome everybody. Uh, Digital Roundtable is back. Uh, the crew is here. Uh, we're missing uh, John Butler in his uh, guitar and playing for some reason. Uh, he's uh, stuck in traffic, I understand. So hopefully he'll show up at some point. Uh, we have a great uh, guest speaker today. But let me start by saluting my cohort, um, Llewellyn King. Llewellyn, how are you today? Very well, thanks, and you likewise, I hope. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing really well. I just came back from having a little outing in South Dakota. Uh, we had uh, little snow flurries and 28 degree Fahrenheit weather, and it was uh, lovely and uh, refreshing. And uh, seems like I brought the cold weather with me to Texas because we're having you know, sort of uh, 65 degree weather in Texas. <laughs> you launched your 40th book? Uh, yeah, yeah, we just recently published my 40th book and uh, got some more books in the works and uh, uh, everything on that on that front is going really well. Um, very interesting new book on um, using blockchain for cyber physical um, control and management, sort of both uh, Cyber security, physical security, all kinds of assets, and leveraging blockchain for that. I think the blockchain, in many ways, sort of the wave of the future. Probably not exactly as it is uh, created today, but uh, some kind of scalable way. Well, I was interested in it when it first sort of burst upon us, and I think it was quite oversold that it was going to do this, this, it was going to revolutionize the utility industry. And I know there was a lot of interest because the articles I wrote about it got a high readership. And then it sort of fell off the radar, as it were. Uh, I think that uh, if you can find a way of using blockchain to say control, uh, um, to, to handle the controls on programmable controllers, which are very vulnerable, moment mm -hmm. uh, and talk about that later that would be extraordinarily interesting yeah we'll, we'll come back to that i think the key of all that is the big boys and speaking of big boys we have a supersonic superstar from one of the biggest big boys if not the biggest big boy microsoft corporation happens to be my professional alma mater and alessandro how are you Hey, Andres, uh, uh, very good afternoon to you. I'm doing well, thank you, I'm doing well. It, it, lo it, looks, uh, it looks like you're in some palace in, uh, in Milan or something, where are you? That's right, that's right, that, that's my house, my, my uh, you know, my, my fall house. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Oh, you, should, you should recognize that, you know, it's a, it's a university nearby here in the, yeah. the outer Washington. Yeah, so, absolutely, well, let me, let me, let me, let me introduce you real quick, and we'll get to we'll get to introduce you to the world here, our world. Uh, you know, the Alessandro Jacobi today is the general manager of the global corporate learning and education cloud at Microsoft Corporation, and he's been there some thirty three years or so. Don't want to date him, but him and I worked in the early days at Microsoft, and. And uh, he has had all kinds of great roles beyond the, his current role. He was a general manager of global education partners and solutions. And before that, the senior director of education strategy and business development. He was also the director of MSN and search portal and channels and at the media services division, which was, I thought that was an interesting job he had for a while. Uh, and then he held before that a significant number of several uh, international product roles in the early days when him and I worked together. Uh, Alessandro holds an MBA from the University of Washington. We will hold that against him. We are, you know, <laughs> rock chalk Jayhawks over here. Uh, there you go. He has a doctorate in economics and marketing from the Università Cattolica di Sacro Cuore. Uh, you know, which is in Milan, is, uh, you know, Catholic University of Sacred Heart. And then he has a master's in sports management, of all things, in law uh -huh. from the Università degli Studi di Firenze. How's my yeah, Italian? Your Italian is getting better by the minute, you know. The bar was so low to begin with that, you know. <laughs> However, I appreciate the effort. Growth mindset. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you letting me 
bastardize all those things. Uh, uh, you, did well. you did well. So let me so let me let me ask you real quick, Alessandra, before we jump into the news, and hopefully John will join us. Uh, tell us real quick about your role at Microsoft. Give us a scope of the kind of customers that you're dealing with. You know, kind of help us understand the picture of corporate learning and and all that. Yeah, no, and thank you, thank you for for having me. It's uh, it's a lo long time overdue. It's a pleasure to to be on your on your panel. And yes, so I, I have been at Microsoft for for a very long time, you know. And uh, you know, perhaps your audience doesn't know that that's actually how we met when you were at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the pioneers uh, a long, long time ago in the late eighties. Um, but uh, what I do is I help our customers, so Microsoft customers. Uh, across industry, the largest customers we have, so you can imagine their, their Fortune 500 type of companies around the world, uh, enable the digital transformation by starting with culture transformation and learning transformation. So uh, we have found that the digital transformation, which of course, you know, is a trillion dollar business. This is happening everywhere from small businesses all the way to the largest enterprises. Um, it's seldom generating the return on investment that's expected if it's not paired up and coupled with a transformation in the people and the employees that are affected by it. And this is a pretty uh, uh, important revelation because we have found that where there is a constant change, which of course, uh, you know, we were talking uh, even before this program started, how change is everywhere. You know, even if you leave COVID aside for a minute, uh, just, uh, you know, you mentioned blockchain, you, you artificial intelligence, and you have 5G, which is now coming, low latency, enabling all sorts of scenarios. You have quantum computing right around the corner. But even the smaller changes really imply that it's almost like having the skills and having the knowledge to get something done is taking a secondary importance to having the ability to acquire new skills and new knowledge all the time. And this is because the way you do your job today is unlikely to be the way you do your job a few months down the road because of all these technology changes. Then you add things like regulatory changes. Like if you live in Britain, as we were discussing earlier, Brexit comes, well, what does that mean? You know, all the change that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Then you have things like COVID and all of a sudden you have to change. There's digital remote work, et cetera. So it's not the new normal, as we now like to say, but it's almost like preparing for the next normal. So how do you do that if you don't have a culture and an environment and infrastructure that allows you to pick up new skills on a regular basis? And so the question becomes, if you rely on just centralized knowledge that is passed on to you by the learning department, by the time you get that knowledge, it may be a little bit too late for you to be able to compete. So in addition to that, that is very important, the corporate knowledge that you have, corporate learning, et cetera. But in addition to that, you have to have the ability to learn from each other and an infrastructure that enables you to ask a question and say, hey, I have this problem right now. I have this issue right now. Does anybody know? Has anybody faced this before? Can anybody help me out? Especially in situations where new normals are showing up all over the place all the time. And you, you know, your book that you just uh, referenced is an example of how, hey, by using blockchain, we'll be doing things differently than before. So how do you prepare for that? How do you prepare for a future that you don't know what it'll be like? And the way you do that is by having as much information predictably as you can, but also enabling social collaboration amongst people, wider networks inside of the enterprise and outside so that you can always be up to date. Right, right. Llewellyn, is Park any questions for you? Well, uh, yeah, a lot of questions, but uh, first I think we might look over the, the, the state of the week. If we... All right, all right, let, let, let me go there then. All right, yeah. so, 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 let me, so, let me, so let me run real quick where we are at. So COVID death are at 225, uh, 225,000, 5,000 up, trending up. Uh, flares are going on everywhere in Europe and everything else. The death toll globally is uh, almost 500,000 cases up. Again, slightly up everything. 
So I got two interesting data points. New data shows how air, air, U.S. airfares have plunged uh, in the last uh, week or so, uh, primarily due to the pandemic. Uh, and air, airlines in, in, are in super trouble. Rumor has it that many of them are going to go bankrupt because there was no bailout from the government. Uh, and then another interesting data point of, of the impact here is that there are 10 cities in the United States that have the most financial uh, distress. And the distress is calculated by credit scores going down, average number of accounts being uh, going down, meaning people closing bank accounts, and then the changes, changes in the number of bankruptcy filings going up. So the top 10 cities are Las Vegas, Chicago, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, Miami, and Fort Worth, Texas. It's fascinating to see that all the large five cities in Texas are in the top 10. <laughs> so well, that's I'm, not, I'm not so sure that that's a good thing, but it's an interesting point to make. The stock market is down in all, in all counts as it, you know, from last week. Price of crude oil is down $2.18. Uh, uh, gasoline prices in the greater Austin remain flat. So, Llewellyn, what do you think? What's happening? Well, I'm, I'm sorry to be right, but over the weeks I've said on this program that things are worse than we think, and they are. Mm -hmm. really, uh, I spent a certain amount of time, I was on the, on the on a similar broadcast this morning in England and hearing the terrible situation and the terrible situation in France, et cetera. And it looks as though things are going to get worse before they get better. And we also are suffering lack of any cohesive political leadership on the issue of the COVID. It is going to change everything, but it, it really plays into the technological future in a way that we had never anticipated. We were moving technologically at what seemed like warp speed. Now it's sped up and seems to be going even faster. But my question initially for Alessandro is uh, what about people who feel threatened by technology that it's hard to grasp? In a way, people like myself, I, I, I talk about blockchain, but it's only a buzzword to me. I don't really understand it, and I've tried to understand it. I've actually sat down with a friend of mine who's a professor at Brown and has taken me through it and all that, but I still don't have any sort of organic grip on it. And, uh, it seems that we're becoming two societies. One that lives in a comfort and is very comfortable with everything that derives from computers, and one which is clinging on or has given up to clinging on to trying to understand enough of it to do their own job. Uh, while I find tremendous enthusiasm in the computer world for the progress being made in computing. I find a great reluctance, a great hesitation elsewhere where people think, do I have to learn more? I've just learned this program. I've just got comfortable with that. I was just doing Skype. Now I've got Zoom. These are, this is a division. This is, this is a divide other than the digital divide. The digital divide is there. But these are people who are smart enough to own a computer to be able to operate it, and yet feel terribly fresh, uh, threatened, as though there's an administration, a uh, government, in, uh, not in exile, but a government in place of people who talk high tech to each other and change our lives without much participation from ourselves. Yeah, so Andres, do you just want me to respond or do you, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead and uh, were, was, there a, was there a final question there, Llewellyn? <laughs> but yeah, what do, you do, what do you do about uh, getting the whole of the society into the world of being at peace with the computer evolution and its speed? Uh, yeah, so it's... Um, you know, Alessandro, for many of us, buying a laptop or buying a telephone is a hugely traumatic experience. We're much more comfortable buying an automobile because we sort of understand those. Uh, and we don't know, do we need this? Do we need that? How many 
bites do we need? How much, you know, it is still a very traumatic business, this interface between the public and uh, the cyber world. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely hear you. Well. It, uh, uh, it's, uh, so there are a number of things that, that you're bringing up, you, you know, what, that, I, that I think you, you, you're, you're addressing. One is uh, the, uh, the ease of technology, you know, how easy is it to use and can you use it without having to develop a certain expertise in it? And uh, certainly there's progress, you know, the fact that many things that you used to be able to do only on a very powerful computer now you can do on a phone is an example of that. The fact that you can just push a button and you can communicate with other people in a video chat, how easy it has become compared to all the steps you had to jump through before is, is an example of that. Uh, but I think embedded in your question, there's the social responsibility and also what do we do about people that uh, um, don't have the skills to be able to participate in, uh, in, in the economy. And uh, uh, we as a company take that very seriously. And in fact, uh, uh, we just recently launched a, an initiative called the Global Skills Initiative that addressed in the United States the fact that there are 30 million jobs that are going, that are open today. And we know from the economic graph that is part of the LinkedIn network, we know those jobs are being recruited for but people are not ready to actually take those jobs. What can we do to help people as consumers, regardless of their affiliation with Microsoft technology or other people's technology? What can we do to help them develop these skills, acquire these skills, and uh, along uh, uh, what we call sort of like a career path perspective? So the ability to have a, a, um, a skill flow that they can follow so that they become not only knowledgeable about these skills, but they can also let the world know that they have these skills now and they're ready for work. So we developed that as part of our initiative, which, which uh, I can talk a little bit more about. But tying it back to the corporate world as we were talking before, there's a very interesting thing happening that because of all this change we're talking about, that once you get a job, interestingly enough, from a learning perspective, that is the starting point, is not the end point. So you don't get educated so you can get a job, then you get a job and you're set with the skills that you brought into the job. It is a continuous reskilling and upskilling that is really making the difference here. And interestingly enough, where you start is important, but it's not a determining factor. So whether you are changing career or you are augmenting your career by taking logical steps, or you're changing career, or you didn't have a career because you didn't have a job before and you acquire one, all of these examples are in the same bucket, which is what we know today is unlikely to be enough for what we need to know a few months or a few years down the road. And uh, a, a nice statistic that I came across that kind of puts things in perspective is that kids who are in college today are expected to change 10 to 15 careers in their lifetime. And so if you do the math, that works out to be an average of two, three, five years, depending on how long your career, you know, your working life will last per career. So that means an incredible open mind, and, but also an incredible burden in terms of becoming really good at a new career all the time. But this is the new world we live in. So in terms of participation, we try to make skills and acquiring skills easy and available. In terms of access to technology, we try to make this available across a multitude of media. So you can have it through a PC, you can have it through a browser to access it in a public, in a public space. You can have it through your phone, through, through a number of ways to access it but also is this culture transformation of accepting that change is part of everything that we do. So we try to address that and we try to make it easy for people to ask each other questions. Social collaboration software, we use Teams, for example, at Microsoft, but it could be anything that you use, is really important to be able to get comfortable to say, hey, I don't know this, you know? 
in, in a, a few years ago in a corporate environment, that was the last thing you wanted to say is, hey, Llewellyn, I, you know, how do you do this? A lot of people would take that as an indication of your ignorance. In fact, some people would take it to the extent of saying, wait a minute, you're asking that question? You don't know that? And you have this job? Like, like what's wrong with you? Maybe you're in the wrong job. So it was very critical. Now in this culture transformation, asking a question, hey, how do you do this? Is not only beneficial to you, but to everybody in your network who is seeing that question, who's benefiting from the answer. And that's the power of social collaboration. So it's a cultural shift that can help people of any age. So you can say older people that have a hard time with technology. Well, you know, we are all in the same boat where there's a lot we don't know. And if we start there, then you know, we might require different modalities, but the step to go from not knowing to knowing is not that different from the Gen Zer compared to the, you know, the oldest of the, the, the employees that you have in your organization. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the question which uh, John Butler and I have discussed on this broadcast in the past is how do big companies allow for innovation and for for basically new ideas. Now we know how Microsoft started and uh, it's an extraordinary story, but in Microsoft or in Boeing or in any other large and dominating company, is it really possible for somebody to come up with an entirely new and different? Would Bill Gates find a home in Microsoft today? <laughs> That is a fantastic question. I never met Gates, but I knew his father, and I actually met his. Oh, it's a long story. The gal who looked after his children, and I interviewed his father, and we prolonged magnificently. It was a very enjoyable experience. He died recently, unfortunately. But would a young, where do the young entrepreneurs go? The people, the startups, and uh, uh, the the dynamic of starting a technology company has changed. Partly because the the venture capital model has changed, has gone from uh, oh this is a good idea, let's get it going, I'm going to have an IPO and we'll make our money, to uh, yeah this is a good idea, who's going to buy you in three years, or who's going to buy you in will Microsoft buy you, will Uber buy you, will uh, this is a very different dynamic, and it's not one that allows for truly independent, new, innovative. Uh, startups and thinking and it extends not just to technology i mentioned boeing in passing and, and advisedly because i think it would be very hard for a young engineer in aerospace with a new idea for a new airframe uh, to get it taken seriously uh, either in the, the military side and the only civilian manufacturer in this country and airbus in, in europe are the only two airframe makers this seems to me to be Prima facie, a, a restriction on innovation. So, go ahead. Did, did, did you want to chime in, Andres? Because I know you know you know. No, a lot no, about no. I, no. So, can can Bill can Bill Gates be hired today and succeed at Microsoft? That that is a fantastic question. And by the way, Bill Gates, uh, uh, senior, uh, he just passed away. So it was yep. uh, it was very sad. Oh, and uh, and sad I know you met him. Yeah, yeah a, a wonderful man. But if, if you think about it, so Bill Gates, you know, Andres knows because in the early days, the company wasn't very big. It was about a thousand employees when we joined. And uh, so it was, you had access to executives. Four, uh, 450. 450 when you joined. Yeah. And they, you know, 25% of the revenue was MS-DOS, just, just yeah. to help the project that Andres and I worked on together. But the, the, the key is this. So if you think about Bill Gates, he started what he started based on an idea that Paul Allen had that you know the microprocessor would change a lot of things because it could bring computing power to a lot of people. Now, Bill was at Harvard. His parents were not happy with him leaving and dropping out of Harvard to go do this technology thing. His path was to finish Harvard and then probably go into law or whatever the case may have been. So he actually broke the mold in a way that took a lot of courage and a lot of conviction and he went after that. But by the same token, you know, uh, Andres and I know that Bill is visionary and amazing genius that he is. He also got a lot of things wrong. 
you know, he, he bet on a lot of things, maybe too early, on other things that didn't pan out, other things that really did pan out in big, big ways. And so this, this, this fail fast culture and move on if you fail or, you know, take something that you believe in and develop it. Today's environment accelerates that dramatically because access to capital is easier than it was before, if nothing else through crowdsourcing, access to the tools that enable you to be successful. Now, if you're talking about aerospace is a little bit different, but you can have ideas inside of a corporation and a company, pitch it and prototype it and, and try to convince people to do it. it. It's a little bit easier today than it was before the internet, before cell phones, et cetera. Now you need to find the right people. And therefore this brings up another really interesting concept, which is the soft skills that you need, the ability to problem solve, persuasion skills, decision-making, executive presence and all of that, which really need to be taught because they make a difference between success and failure sometimes. For example, what I do at Microsoft is I talk to chief learning officers of the largest companies in, in the world. And Andres knows this because he was part of our latest conference. Now, four years, now, three, two, two and a half to three years ago, when I thought that this was an important thing to do, and I started asking our account managers in the field, hey, who is the chief learning officer for Coca-Cola? Who is the chief learning, and, and I'm asking the account team of Coca-Cola, nobody knew what a chief learning officer was and what, what it meant. You know, it, it was so new in terms of our way of thinking because traditionally we speak to, to, to IT decision makers rather than business decision makers. So, you know, I failed so many times by being told, look, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And if I hadn't had the ability to persevere because I've been at Microsoft a long time and I know a lot of people and say, no, this is an important group. We really, really want to spend time with them and learn from them because they really charted the future of companies in terms of learning. So I failed many times. This time through perseverance, it turned into something really important to Microsoft. But that's just an example, and I've been there a long time. But a great idea could come from the shuttle driver. It could come from the person that joined yesterday. It could come from somebody who just shared something. The, the zero to 60, so to speak, the first mile of getting it off the ground, in my opinion, is easier today than it's ever been before because of access to technology, social, network, et cetera, and the ability, you have a great idea, you can collaborate with somebody in New Zealand tomorrow morning who has similar interests. When Andres and I joined Microsoft to communicate with each other, we had a Xenix based email system, character based where we had to type every letter to just connect, if you remember that. So it was a lot harder back then than it is right now. The flip side is that you brought up and rightly so, selling the company to somebody. And this brings me to the final concept that I want to share that I learned by failing a lot, which is ultimately I hate to label things and particularly I hate to label people. But what I've come across is that people who start companies ultimately at a very high level generalize fall into two categories. The ones who do it with the end in mind and the exit strategy in mind. So they say, I start this because I think five years from now I can sell this to this type of company. And those who fall in love, it becomes their baby what they started. And these are two very different category of entrepreneurs. One that starts feeling like, hey, I have a responsibility to my employees, even if I only have two. You know, even if I only have two and they're part-time, but feel like this is my thing and by golly, I'm gonna make it successful. And so resilience, perseverance, all, all these things come into play. The other one is instead more prone to say, hey, I started this. It doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to get it to the point where I sell it out. I just got excited about this other new idea then I'll veer off into their new territory and I'll start another company. So that fail fast that we talked about later. 
I think there's room for both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Thank you. And very interesting. That's, that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great insight. Let, let me pause here real quick and make my quick commercial uh, about our um, annual conference. So we had a, we had our annual conference uh, via Zoom on August 18th, 19th, 20th, 25th, 26th, 27th. It was fantastic. We have over 70 speakers, 16 keynotes, 11 panels. And we're working on the videos now. We're probably a week away from publishing the 28 videos of all the keynotes and the panels. And here's uh, the snapshot of the companies that were there. Uh, doing keynotes and so on and so on. Hopefully we'll have Microsoft in the future uh, uh, joining us. And uh, our new conference date is uh, for 2021 is May 18, 19 and 20th. And we're hoping God willing with all the COVID um, uh, you know, guidelines that we need to follow that we'll do it face to face at the embassy suites in San Marcos. So uh, just wanted to let you know about that real quick. And then I want to thank Texas State University for sponsoring our digital roundtable. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me let me go back real quick to some of the things, Alessandra. I think we were talking to you earlier about how we track what's happening on a week-to-week -week basis. And it's just fascinating the amount of transformation and the amount of investment that is going on globally on, on digitalization. So uh, from la since last week, Qualcomm has just bolstered the 5G infrastructure play uh, by bringing out into the market a new, what they call the virtual RAN platform. So in the old days, in order to build a, a network, you needed to build a RAN, which is basically the runtime access network capability. And there's a bunch of software to make that happen. And Ericsson and Nokia were the only two companies or whoever was the the infrastructure provider for the telco infrastructure were the only companies that sort of had the network operating system, if you will. And now all of a sudden there's a significant number of companies in the model of a Linux, if you will, that are proposing all these new platforms, right? So that any company off the shelf without having any knowledge can basically buy this platform to run the network, buys the components and the hardware for the different companies that sell them, puts it together, sort of like you buy a bunch of PCs, get Windows, and you now you're up in business, right? So, it, so the telco business and the complexity of the telco business, primarily driven by the 5G capabilities, is just exploding. And the, and the prediction is that there will be 10,000 private networks built, built by corporations for their own use in their own footprint, managing their own infrastructure, their own sensors, their own capabilities, trucks, and what have you. And, and so it's fascinating to see that. Um, Legato had just raised uh, four, uh, $4 billion to support their new L-band uh, network. So they're a satellite company that has got approval from the SEC to develop a low orbit satellite broadband capability using an L-band. Uh, so again, another provider, just like AT&T and Verizon, here comes Legato Networks and here comes SpaceX and here comes Amazon with Blue Origin that is doing the same. And here comes, you know, uh, 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 Dish and, and DirecTV who are doing the same. And so all of a sudden there's going to be broadband 5G offerings from a significant number of players, right? More importantly and interestingly, and I'm not so sure that because it's so new, that we're going to get the details from Alessandro, but Microsoft made an acquisition not too long ago of a company called Affirm Networks that works in building networks for enterprises. So uh, traditionally, this where you know the fiber, how you deploy the fiber, MPLS, and Wi-Fi, and what have you. But what's happening with 5G is that the corporations again want to build their own campus-wide networks to manage not just people and communications, but how assets and sensors are controlled and integrated, giving feedback so that the AI and the ML can be leveraged with, you know, say Microsoft Azure, Microsoft AI and so on. So fascinating that Microsoft is, you know, just jump into that in June during the COVID days. And now they're having this massive deployment in Taiwan 
as as the very first uh, you know private network in Taiwan, which is a very fascinating and critical high tech market to you know sort of cut your teeth in, and then. Orange, which is a, a UK company, a well, European company, but originally from the UK, a wireless carrier, is offering now private 5G global scale support services. So again, again, you know, and we talked a little bit about it. It seems like 5G is a key element of how the internet is going to find its way into the world, and how IoT is going to find its way into everything. What is, what is the Microsoft thinking, uh, Alessandro? What's your take on 5G? How fast is it coming? Is it hype? Is it happening? Is it a, yeah, it's Europe ahead of the US? What, what's your take? Uh, well, it, I, I can give you a broad perspective because you're asking me uh, questions that are in areas that I don't uh, particularly spend my, my day in. But at the, at the um, a general level, um, clearly, uh, cloud computing is here to stay. And uh, once we get into into quantum computing as well, you know, you could say that we almost have as much compute power as we need. Now, the real problem we need to solve is speed. You know, to be able to process data at at a speed that enables us to really tackle issues that we haven't been able to tackle before. So you get to quantum computing, and you have uh, you, you know, you, you have stimulators initially and eventually you'll have your know, quantum computers that work completely, as I see that we're, we're joined by, by John. But the, the, uh, the thing that we learned even in the early day, you know, when we had uh, the PC with, you know, powered by Intel processors and AMD, et cetera, is the power of the ecosystem. Ultimately, things are so complex that even new infrastructure technologies uh, it's very complicated for a company to do it all by themselves. And especially in 5G, you mentioned in the beginning, it was Nokia and Ericsson. There's just so many other companies. Qualcomm has always been sort of like the 5G company. It really requires a network and infrastructure, but ultimately is what is the scenario that you enable such that a consumer or an enterprise will want to make the investment in the new technology? Mm -hmm. and then choose the right one for that. So that ecosystem play, the trying out, the showing the scenarios, what is it that you enable? I'll give you a quick, quick example, just because you brought up sports before mm -hmm. in terms of the studies that I did in it. In sports, because 5G enables low latency, you can now have in-game betting, micro betting, if you will. You know, it's not a matter of who wins the game and the spread. It's now a matter of, you know, will the next shot go in, touch the rim, Go off to the right, go off to the left. You can actually do that kind of, you know, low latency scenario. That's just a very simple example. that has got nothing to do with productivity and et cetera. But it, it's an example of what is the scenario that you enable. And to get to that point, it's not just a matter of infrastructure where it's a little bit faster to consume content on the internet. Okay, that is one broad horizontal scenario. But then in addition, you have a lot of other industry-based specific scenarios that you enable. So having the infrastructure, you mentioned Taiwan. So that, that, that's one sample of trying out everything that we've been talking about. And so the, the world is a, is a big place and technology changes all the time. So the ability to create these new scenarios and having at the core, the fact that it's powered by cloud computing and we do our part there with our technology is, is, is really critical. So without going into too much detail, which I wouldn't know, I can tell you that that's typically how we look at the world. Yeah. Hey, John, well, welcome back, John. Well, thank you very much. I got caught in a, in a Zoom crossing here. No, no, no worries. We, we, are, we are getting uh, Alessandro's perspective on the impact of 5G in the world. <laughs> so if, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on that. Uh, Luella, you had any questions from that? Yeah, just a quick one. We, uh, somebody uh, wrote in and wanted to know uh, what was the name of the company uh, uh, promoting L-Band, which you mentioned. Yeah, so L-Band is a satellite band. It, it's the frequency that, you know, you can go look it up at the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, real quick. The name of the company is Legato Networks. Legato, as in the, the Portuguese word for connecting to people, L-I-G-A-D-O, 
networks? So, well, my question had to do, as I was listening to you, with the international relations and, 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 and the technology and, and China and where we are in terms of the control, uh, the advancement in 5G, we're almost to 6G, right, quite frankly. So what's, what's the relationship between a new business models and what's happening in China with 5G since they, they really, really, in a real sense, uh, uh, show the light for this technology? You're asking me? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, again, lots of rabbit holes that we can go into. The key, the key that I see is this, and, and I keep trying to explain to people, the communications industry, while advanced in what it delivers, it's only being controlled by a few people for a long time. Right. And what's happening now with 5G is that that monopoly, if you will, that Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, and a few other companies have is breaking down. And so you are going to have a, you know, I don't know if you remember in the old days, IBM had the largest telecom network in the world in the 60s yeah. because of their mainframes. And eventually they sold their network to AT&T. Mm -hmm because it wasn't lucrative for them to run it again. So what's happening is we're going back to the future. And my prediction is that any major global company will build their own 5G network globally for their own needs. Because what's happening is, it's not just the people communication, which is the easy part, if you can make it easy, quote unquote, right? But we're going from a billion things connected in the US about 200, you know, 320 million people have cell phones and there are some other 600 million things connected to the internet in the US. So that's a billion things. The total number of billion things globally is about 10 billion things. We're going from 10 billion things globally to 300 billion things connected. And in order for that to happen, we cannot just sit here and wait for AT&T and Verizon to provision all those things. It's just not going to happen. So, so the corporations are taking over this. And they're building first their own networks to manage their own infrastructure, their own factories, their own fulfillment centers, whatever, their own trucks, their own airplanes. And after that, they'll go out and sell capabilities to their customers, wherever their customers are. That's what's going to happen, right? And so... So you, you can see that, you know, as we track every week what's going on with 5G, it's almost like you can tell by connecting the dots. I mean, the fact that Microsoft, you know, without asking Alessandro to say anything that hasn't happened in a, in a quarterly call, you know, I, I, am, I am convinced, totally convinced that the big boys are all going to be selling telecom services, all of them. <laughs> and so that's a game changer, right? Because... Oh, yeah. Because then what comes after that, if you know Microsoft or Amazon or Facebook or Google or this guy, is they're going to integrate that service, that capability in, with software in the cloud in a way that has never been integrated before. And it will deliver sort of like, you know, we all talk jokingly, got BB app, Scotty, computer, what is two plus two? You know, connect me with it, there are no sort of Rex and Planet X, Y, and Z. That's how that's going to happen. It will be the corporations driving that, right? And they will also launch their low low flying satellites. Absolutely, yeah. We we talked about that. That you know, SpaceX and Blue or Origin and uh, and now Legato Networks and others have gotten you know permission from the FCC from the federal government to build low orbit broadband networks. And that that's a game changer, right? And, and to, to bring it all, excuse me for interrupting, but mm -hmm. just, just super quickly, uh, Andres, you may remember that to, to bring the conversation in full circle, mm -hmm. and uh, Llewellyn, you had mentioned it at the beginning in terms of uh, ideas and, and innovation, et cetera. Bill Gates and Bruce McCall, remember Bruce McCall's Cellular One was, was the pioneer in the cell technology in the, the Seattle area. In 1990, they, they contributed to a company 
and this idea of low, low orbit uh, satellites, you know, right. the teledesica started and, and there were a bunch of, they were way ahead of their time, about That's 30 right. years ahead of their time. But this is not a new concept. So it's the idea that as technology evolves, it's not that the satellite technology has evolved, is everything around the satellite that has evolved. In fact, the satellite probably looks almost identical to the way it looked 30 years ago, but everything around it that enables it is important. And then finally, in terms of application and social responsibility and Llewellyn that we were talking about earlier, now you can give broadband access to people in rural areas. Right. And that's a big deal because that empowers then people who don't have the same level of opportunities to be able to participate and not only participate, but they participate with a fresh new outlook on the opportunity. So it's, it's like when, uh, you know, how South Korea bypassed everybody with broadband access, they went from, you know, they skipped the whole dial up generation and they went from poor infrastructure to broadband to everybody. So it's like, it's, it's, it's really exciting what's possible, but it has to be done in a responsible way. And, 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 just, and just to close the loop on that point, the number one vertical leveraging 5G globally will be agricultural farming. So in the old days, you had to actually teach somebody to be a farmer and explain to them all the things about farming. Now, all you need is a satellite network infrastructure to manage that network, software with best practices and AI, ML, connection to the weather and send the machines. And the machines are all robots. They do the planting, they move around the combine. So all you need is land. So all of a sudden you take Africa, for example, and the Chinese are trying to do this right now in, in several of the American companies, ADM and, and John Deere and others are trying to do this in Africa as well in, in partnership with the local governments. But it's basically, give me a thousand acres or 10,000 acres and we're gonna make corn. Don't worry about labor, don't worry about people. It's all machine driven. You know, talking to satellites, 5G, you know, software driven. So, so that's the beginning of a robotic planet, if you will. It will be the agricultural industry doing it first. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so, so the one thing about all that, John, uh, it, it's a business model. So speaking of business models, uh, since you are, you know, the it, superstar at the McCone School of Business and all the things you've done there uh, over the 30 plus years, 40 years you've worked there. So here's what's happening on smart cities. The gas tax, which is already broken, according to all experts, is going to go away, is dead because of COVID, right? If we're not collecting taxes from people pumping in the gas because nobody's traveling, how do we pay for the roads? How do we pay for all kinds of things, right? Um, and here's another broken model. So Sidewalk Labs, a company owned by Google, was doing a smart city project in Toronto and they failed. I mean, they walked away from the project and lost a few billion dollars. Toyota announced that they are actually have a big project, the car company, a big project on building the city of the future. So if you remember how things work in Japan and in Asia, a manufacturer usually builds a town to do something and they build the housing and the schools for the people that are gonna work in the plant to do that something, right? So now Toyota is saying, all my plants in Japan are gonna become smart cities. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting that a car company is pushing that angle. Right. Uh, you probably re heard and, you know, hear from the news. Lyft and Uber have been ordered to reclassify in California all their employees to full time. Mm -hmm. So if the gig economy gets forced to do that, all the companies go bankrupt. They can their business model is not built for that. Right. And so it's kind of fascinating. So, so what do you all think is happening with the business model? COVID seems to be having a major impact on things. Well, it, is, it is definitely going to have a major impact, but we don't know how major. A lot depends on whether we do get a vaccine in time and whether people accept the vaccine. 
but we're going to have a very bleak winter and a lot of companies are going to go out of business and a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. But I'd like to backtrack just a moment. And yeah. Now, you let off a hydrogen bomb just now when you explained how agriculture would all be digital and you said it would start in Africa. The principal occupation of the people of Africa is subsistence farming. That is what they do. And that's, that's Africa. It's subsistence farming. You bring in uh, uh, digital farming and you get a flood of immigrants, migrants going to Europe first and later here because there will be nothing left for them. It is a very large human problem that is on the horizon. I agree. Well, let's, let's, let's think first of all about the, the business model. Certainly we'll get the taxes from somewhere else. So you remember when, when the question is, will, will the internet be taxed? We have, we have no income tax in Texas, but our, our, our property taxes are high. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if the gas tax goes away, uh, perhaps also we might not have a need for many roads if everybody starts flying around, cars start flying around like bumblebees, uh, which of course they're, they're working on. But I think also um, with the, uh, the mechanization, if you will, of, ag of agriculture, it's really, really interesting. But I also think that there has to be people to understand how to run things, how to maintain the machines. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the job situation will go from agriculture to more of an engineering kind of job. Because it's, it's pretty interesting to note that every change in technology has really produced more and better jobs, not, not, not really less jobs, if we do the right things. Right. Uh, Ever since from the from the horse to the take a look at, at what it takes to take people from subsistence farming to maintaining farm equipment. I know a little bit about this because I'm an African. And yeah. it's uh, it's a huge leap. My father was much engaged in it. He was an engineer, mechanic, handyman, whatever you call it. And a lot of his life consisted of teaching people things like why a hammer needs to be weighted, the difference between the various threads or nuts and screws. And it's a lot of teaching. It's not going to happen in a hurry, but you might mechanize, you use the word mechanize, digitize. I, 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 don't, I don't know about that. I think that... Yeah, yeah, what happens is that everything now is, you know, it's like automobiles. You know, they're all computers. It's all one little slip. So if somebody comes in to work on my television and they take a chip about as big as my as my thumb and put it in and charge me eight hundred dollars. So I think what's happened is you know I, I go to the store to check out and everything is beep, beep, beep. I can remember we had to be still to do this. So in a lot of sense, whether it's flying an airplane or doing a machine, our technology has made has taken the human element out of even maintaining uh, the machines. One of the cleanest places in the world now is the mechanic shop in a Toyota place. It looks like a restaurant is so clean. There's no oil dripping, there's nothing dripping. So it might be Llewellyn that training people in this century is not as complicated as it was years ago. It might be a little easy. Well, well let, let's see if we can get some data points for the from the general manager, chief learning officer, expert. So Alessandro, what are companies doing to train their people? Are they sending them to an MBA or are they doing more certificate style, three weeks, four weeks learning? And is Microsoft, when Microsoft teaches what it does, you know, we, we have had Microsoft University forever. It, how does Microsoft does his, own, does his own teaching of the product that they sell to the marketplace? Is that, is that accelerated? You know, can I, but can I get a download into my memory through a chip? Well, what's happening there? Yeah, well, <clears throat> so we are doing a lot in terms of teaching people how to use our products, particularly complex products like uh, infrastructure plays like Azure, et cetera, cloud computing, and, and I can go into details of that. Um, but if I, if I may, I wanted to backtrack a little bit on the conversation that just happened because um, you teach me, especially as a university professor or professors, plural, that ultimately, when you look at the economy over the last 20 years, from the dot-com all the way to now, ups and downs, the companies that survive typically are not the ones that make the big, big leap into mm -hmm. something radically new. 
There are some that do, like Tesla. But most companies that survive and do super well are the ones that take things that people are doing today and just do them better and just do them, you know, like, like you take Amazon. Amazon hasn't really come up with a whole new industry, right? It, it is, you know, I'm talking about Amazon.com and then mm -hmm. we can talk about AWS. But it's like, hey, it's a, it's, I go to the store, I buy something I need and I take it home. It's the exact same thing that Amazon is doing it, but it's doing it with a heck of a lot of data. So it knows what I do and what I like and it proposes what I might be interested in. But ultimately, instead of going to the store, I just go to my computer or my phone and I buy something and that thing shows up in my door. But it's the same, you know, that the problem statement is, how do I get something I don't have? How do I go buy it? Right. And, and so you, you look at, there are examples everywhere. Of this. So when we're talking about, hey, we won't need roads anymore because people will be flying with jetpacks from, from point A to point B. It's true. You know, it's like, why are we building stadiums to go back to sports mm -hmm. when you can have the same experience with some AR, VR goggles? You're right there on the floor with the players. You know, there are all sorts of predictions. And we joked earlier about how Bill Gates, you know, we used to have videos at company meetings at Microsoft of all the wrong predictions that Bill made just, just to have fun. But it's very easy to predict what the world will look like. Yet we are in 2020 and pretty much all the COVID models that predicted how many deaths there would be are wrong. And these are models that came from Oxford, the University of Washington and the Gates Foundation, et cetera. So we need to ask ourselves, how can it possibly be that in an era of AI, we cannot predict the number of hospital beds that will be needed, the number of ventilators that will be needed. So it's, it's much more fundamental than that. It is, there are, when we talk about the future and everybody being engineers, turns out that in data science, for example, you know, the science that we keep talking about in COVID realm, in reality, in data science, the number one job is data normalization which means you have data sets that come from different places in the COVID environment. Hospitals send you data in terms of number of people who tested positive. Well, the data that this hospital is sending to you and the data that this other hospital is sending to you, is that the same thing? Are they measuring the same thing in the same way? So you need to dedicate resources and software to normalize the data. The people who normalize the data are not PhDs in rocket science. You know, you have people who have, you know, good logical skills that can be applied. So I'm saying this because I just want us to take a leap in terms of our approach from a culture perspective. Mm -hmm. If there is automation of farming in Africa and people only know how to farm the current way, that doesn't mean that their brain power will not be applied to the new way of doing things. It could be that innovation comes from Africa of now that I have a machine that's doing the crop maintenance work, what do I do with the products that I get? And maybe I come up with a new delivery mechanism. Maybe I come up with a new solution and scenario that comes out of the products that I have because I have time to apply and I have access to this technology that now I have access to because I have a satellite, low orbit satellite bringing me broadband. So it doesn't mean that the next big ideas has to come from Cupertino or from Mountain View or from New York City. It can come from Rwanda. You know, it, it can be somebody that has an amazing idea and that idea is accelerated because now you have access to technology. So I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place but I wanna bring it home by saying this requires a leap of faith in our approach, in, in a growth mindset of, hey, you know, it, it doesn't mean the future is not a predictor of the, 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 the past is not a predictor of the future as much as it used to be, because the innovation, the slightly better way of doing the thing we were doing anyway, and will continue to do, may come from two kids in a garage in Nairobi. And you really may, and they I have the that. ability to let us know about it because of the internet and if they have access to broadband. So it, it's look at India, for example, India of 10 years ago 
in India of now, where almost, you know, look at the number of Fortune 500 companies that have an Indian CEO, including Microsoft. Who would have predicted that 20 years ago, right? So it's like, hey, the human, the human mind is an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, once you give it access to opportunities, it can bring about amazing innovation. You're right. We have talked about the signal and the noise. And there's, there's no economic theory or mathematical theory that can that could have predicted a microdale or an apple or whatever have you. And as you know, for the for for the data scientists, is is uh, we use the same equations that we use in the non-human world. Uh, the problem is that in in physics, a rock will always fall. And 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 with uh, what we do with our theory is that people will change their mind. So this is why we will always have economic crisis or financial crisis. But it is a way for us to 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 peek into. I say that finance allows us to create a future when there is no future to give us confidence to invest in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Great happy talk, and I wish I could endorse it. But I see technologies that are job subtracting and huge uh, explosions in populations in parts of the world less uh, less able to deal with them than the advanced world. I think that represents an enormous human crisis ahead for us. I'm glad you mentioned India because India, I have known for a very long time, Indians were enormously creative people. And uh, I remember writing and lecturing about where is India as China began to emerge, where was India? And I'm so glad to say India is on board as it were. It was held back very largely by bad economic policies introduced uh, essentially off, immediately after the uh, uh, liberation of India or after the end of the Raj in 1948. Yeah, so, so you know, I mean, it, clearly there's a balance. In, this is a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, but, uh, you know, I remain super optimistic that this transformation of true digitalization embracement of all the old guard industries to catch up with computer, telco, retail, airlines, industries, and other financial services are way advanced, right? When you think about water, energy, and others, that, that is, to me, it's just fascinating that finally I can see the building blocks of a better lifestyle, a better quality, more learning, better learning, um, you know, more efficient use of, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and, and resources and a more sustainable living, right? And, and um, it's exciting. To, I think it's super exciting. Um, I want to, you know, close up here by thanking Alessandra for spending an hour with us. And, uh, I, I, you know, I get inspired hearing you talk about corporate learning, corporate education, because you know, clearly, I think it would be enterprises going forward that will drive these new behaviors and these new thinkings and mastering failing fast and all that because their reach, their reach is tremendous, right? And and um, and obviously the new possibilities for entrepreneurship. So so thank you, Alessandro, for sharing with us today. And uh, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts on 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 our our small little corner here of the digital roundtable. Well, the, um, I, I think, um, thank you for the opportunity to have me here. Fascinating conversation. And clearly, uh, um, you, you guys are leaders in your, in your industry. And uh, especially as professors, you are shaping the minds uh, of the future in, in a way that will provide amazing innovation. I will just close with social responsibility, saying that that's uh, a critical, critical part. And so the, our announcement to want to be uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and by 2050, uh, taking care of all the carbon that from the inception of Microsoft in 1975 until now. So just, just go uh, zero or negative from their perspective. The commitment to being water, um, uh, I don't know exactly the term, but it's basically to be able to sustain everything that we do just by recycling the, the, the water that we have by 2030 is is another very, very important aspect. So there's social responsibility and uh, you learn more about that every single day because maybe there's something you didn't think about and it's important to react to that as well. So 
Uh, I appreciate all the points that were shared and thank you for having me. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. I want to say that I'm honored to be on with you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I really, really enjoyed your comments. Hey, John, I don't know if you brought your guitar to do a close out or anything, but I've got it. It's right there. You mean to reach across the table? Go get it. Go get it. Yeah. It's we, right here. We need, to, we need to cross out with some music. Alessandro needs to hear you play. I know. I didn't know there was entertainment built in. Oh, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Like a, oh, yeah. And, it's a five senses experience. It's a <laughs> John, John is a multi talented human being. You know, it's uh, fascinating to hear him uh, play guitar and sing and. Yeah, you know, uh, Here he comes. You know, that was my, uh, uh, you know, that was my, uh, if you get the feeling all alone, when your good time friends have all got up and gone, don't come knocking around my door because I've heard your lies before. There ain't gonna be a next time this time. Woman starting right now. I'm gonna forget your name and your pretty face. Write you off as a total disgrace, you know that. Some people they are lovers, and some just got no sense. But a person like you ought to be ashamed of the thing that you do to me. Woo! <laughs> Okay. 